Uh, fellow citizens of Uganda, first of all, I would like to say that uh, if uh, anything happens to me, uh, just know who is responsible. Every year in September, Uganda remembers the tragic 1972 abduction and disappearance of Uganda's Chief Justice, the late Benedict Chiwanuka. What the 1974 Commission of Inquiry revealed about this disturbing case and what the government investigations achieved back then is that Amin already got all the people behind this uh, heinous, senseless crime and put them on firing squad, as the entire world has already seen in the news pictures. However, one other individual has since come out to declaring himself the only survivor of the gang, thus incriminating himself in this harrowing case. He therefore now has to answer to the families of his victims particularly on the question of the whereabouts of Ben Tuanuka's body. As far as the Amin government was concerned, the criminals were found when one of them was seen in Bali driving the very vehicle whose registration number UUU171 was reported by eyewitnesses at the scene of Ben Tuanuka's abduction, which had happened exactly four months earlier. The armed kidnappers were, according to their own comrades' subsequent statements in the press, plotting their next crimes from this town in eastern Uganda. Evidence reportedly collected from their hideout after it was raided by police included a hit list of names of senior public personalities to abduct and or murder. A list that contained the name of Ben Tuanuka already ticked presumably as mission accomplished. Three terrorists were reported as neutralized on the spot that January day and one officer injured. The exchange of fire took place at House 49 Makulu Housing Estate in Bali as the terrorists started shooting their way out of their surrounded hideout. Other simultaneous raids got other terrorists. In all, 12 were got alive, put on trial and sentenced to firing squad for murder the following month on February 11th. However, one had fled arrest in Bali, and nobody knew who this scampering criminal was until when he himself wrote about his own escape in his own book, Sowing the Mustard Seed. What he wrote, and I quote, When Amin soldiers knocked at the door asking about the vehicle, I knew we were finished. I had the car keys in my pocket. So he knew that uh, the investigating officers had... Uh, followed up the investigation properly and uh, connected the dots and got up to him and the fellow criminals knowing what they had done on uh, uh, September 19th, uh, 1972 to uh, Chief Justice Benedict Chowanoka. This case is therefore really simple. The person driving Volkswagen number UUU171 clearly has some sp uh, explaining to do to the people of Uganda regarding the Ben Chuanuka case. Meanwhile, it seems that the fugitive was originally just trying to show off to the uh, public that he once fought Amin's soldiers in Bali, forgetting that this incident was a security operation specifically hunting for Ben Chuanuka's kidnappers, and thus the unwitting revelation by the fugitive that he was one of the people surrounded that day at House 49, and also that he was the driver of the vehicle parked outside that house, links him directly to Ben Benjuanuka's abduction. Basically, had he just shut up about the whole Bali incident, nobody would have ever been able to connect the dots, nobody would have ever been able to link the crime to him ever, and they wouldn't be writing this sad history here today. It all started on 19th September 1972, when a major invasion of Ugandan rebels from Tanzania took place. They were, however, swiftly defeated in battle and started undressing frantically. Each one left their rebel uniforms wherever they were and ran to mix into the civilian population where citizens themselves first started cloppering them in mob justice. However, others managed to flee for dear life and vanished in, the, in thin air. Just three days later, on 22nd, Chief Justice Benedicto Chuanuka was abducted in broad daylight from his offices in Kampala. In the three months following Ben Chuanuka's abduction, at least eight other senior personalities were also kidnapped and disappeared in exactly the same modus operandi, never to be seen alive again. These include J. 
Joseph Mubiru, governor of Bank of Uganda, who was abducted just one week after Ben Chuanuka, then followed by the kidnap of Frank Kalimuzo, vice chancellor of Makerere University, Minister John Kalema, Minister Basil Bataringaya, Haji Kasigwa, a town treasurer of Jinja, Jolly Joe, who was a comedian and labor activist, and several others. May their souls rest in peace. But it all started with Ben Chuanuka, Uganda's first ever indigenous prime minister, a legacy not diminished even by time. Many might have seen a picture of Captain Tom Masaba of the Uganda Army, surrounded by his fellow soldiers, before he was executed by firing squad in public on 10th February 1973. He is reportedly the person who gave the terrorists the vehicle whose number plate eyewitnesses had noted in uh, the broad daylight abduction. The eyewitnesses had actually put, reported a Peugeot 504 registration number UUU171, but when police checked the vehicles registered at the Ministry of Transport, they found that this number was registered actually to a Volkswagen, not a Peugeot, and that the Volkswagen actually belonged to the army. So investigators went to the military to find out who in the army had been assigned the Volkswagen. That's when Captain Tom Masaba was summoned as the person who was assigned the Volkswagen Beetle UUU 171. A thorough uh, interrogation then took place and Captain Thomas Saba made all the revelations about the terrorist group he had been working with behind everyone's back, including how they had simply swapped the number plates of the two vehicles. Of the two vehicles. Masaba also gave information about the whereabouts of the Volkswagen and the terrorists' hideout. Acting on this information extracted from Captain Tom Masaba, investigators mounted surveillance at House 49 Maluku Housing Estate. It is then that undercover agents saw the wanted Volkswagen arriving at the premises. Other terrorists were inside the premises already and about to have a meeting on their next operation. Police decided to knock at the door. Simultaneously, other raids took place which netted 12 terrorists alive, including the late James Karambuzi, all of them arrested on information obtained from Thomas Abba's interrogation. It is noteworthy that evidence found at the scene corroborated Masaba's information and more weapons were found as recently as uh, 27th August 2018 by workers who were building a new house for Karambozi's family on his home premises in Kavali, uh, that is in south-western uh, Uganda. Police was called in to retrieve the now rusted cash. However, back in 1973, when asked if he had any last words, Captain Tom Masaba apologized for his crimes to all the Ugandans watching the firing squad that day. I have not written all of this lightly and have done so knowing that those who feel entitled to getting away with murder might be displeased. However, I have done this for the people of Uganda, for the victims, for their bereaved relatives, and for this country to start putting its difficult truths on the table. So after 50 years of hiding in plain sight and spewing propaganda, disinformation and political theater on these murders as has been seen during the annual memorials, there is now nowhere else for the killer to hide from these crimes. Uh, he mistakenly incriminated himself and he is now out there for everyone to see every day as he pretends to be busy on matters of national significance. However, I urge him to first come clean and just apologize to the families of the deceased and tell them the whereabouts of the remains of all the hapless victims. In a TV interview during his 1980s Bush war, about a decade after these abductions and disappearances, rebel leader Yoweri Museveni stated, at least Amin only targeted the elites, but Oboti is just slaughtering everyone. They're very much worse than they were under Amin, because under Amin, first of all, Idi Amin was not killing uh, people outside the intellectual class. He was killing only the the, the elite, elements from the elite, who were threatening his position, or sometimes uh, over rivalry, over business, things like that. But he never touched the peasantry. But Obote is killing everybody. Museveni was at the time leading his infamous five-year rebel war to topple the brutal tribalism of President Apollo Milton Obote, a conflict known to have left hundreds of thousands of innocent peasants dead and both Obote and Museveni even decorating Uganda's roadsides with the skulls of their victims as the two fought each other for power after the Amin government. 
in all of this, we have to ask ourselves one simple mathematical question. If on one hand, Apollo Milton Obote was a mass murderer who was just slaughtering everyone, as uh, Museveni says, though later in life, Apollo Milton Obote apologized to Amin for all the false accusations uh, in a phone call from exile in Zambia to Amin in Saudi Arabia. And then on the other hand, Museveni was found in Mbale instigating and carrying out the very abductions and disappearances of elites whom he then says Amin killed. Who then are the actual two monsters of Uganda and who therefore is the upright leader who for decades has been wrongfully accused of murder? Furthermore, there is this unfathomable level of macabre where the self-confessing culprit of the murders of elites attends the annual memorial of the very elites he brutally murdered. Many would, many would equate this to a killer symbolically dancing on the graves of his victims. Essentially, the cruelty of wanting to disturb the peace of the dead 50 years later and doing so in eerie somberness right in front of the victims, families, and some Bentu and Uka betrayers, yet as the self-confessed sole survivor of the Mbale incident where all four men found to have heinously disappeared Chief Justice Bentu and Uka were dealt with why doesn't he just tell Democratic Party Secretary General Nobat Mao, all of the party members, or the public, and the poor late Ben Chuanuka's family, where he and his fellow criminals dumped the late Chief Justice's body so that the deceased can be given an appropriate state funeral? In light of all this, I would uh, like everyone to know that we, the Amin family, understand best anyone who has suffered immense mental trauma and harrowing emotional distress stemming from cruel disinformation waged against them with false and baseless accusations that are literally hurting innocent people and generating tremendous stigma, grotesque myths, uh, ridicule, malice, uh, demonization and propaganda against any innocent person. Who on this planet has been able to withstand the worst lies and the most vagabond insults against an innocent person more than what Amin has been the victim of? Yet he remained silent and not even responded to the deliberate heinous disinformation orchestrated against him every single day for over 50 years and counting by angry, malicious, unapologetic killers and political charlatans who frantically try to dodge carrying responsibility for their own crimes. Let me know when you find that person. Thank you.